Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we can come here in your presence today. I pray that you speak to us, that you minister to us, that, Lord, that your word comes alive in our hearts, that, Father, that we may be conformed more into your image, that we can leave this place knowing you more. And I thank you, Father, for what you are wanting to do in us and through us. In Jesus' name. And the people of God say, Amen. Well, it's good to be at church. You know, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I shared a message called The Old Normal. And this sort of came about from a thought because, uh, you know, uh, I just kept hearing every time, you know, you, you, you hear information on the news or you hear bits here and there. And all you keep hearing is something about, oh, you know, this is the new normal. And I'm like, you know, well, it's cool to have some new things, right? Like, it's good to embrace new technologies and things that are going to help us be more efficient and things that are going to help us to do things better. There's nothing wrong with that. But we've got to be careful that, you know, we, we don't forget the good old things, you know, I mean, we, we have a tendency as, as people to find ourselves in difficult situations and then making dysfunction normal. We have a way of making our problems become normal. And, and we do something over and over and we encounter a problem and then that problem becomes part of our natural everyday life. And we just embrace that as normal. Well, today I'm here to talk about the old normal, the things of old that should be the same forever. And so a couple of weeks ago when I started speaking on this, I spoke about the good old Word of God. Amen? Today I want to talk about the good old prayer. Isn't that cool? Anyone excited to talk about prayer? I'm excited. You know, at the end of the day, we've all been created to have a relationship with God. And the basics of a relationship is talking. I'm married to Rebecca 20 years next month. Isn't that cool? She put up with me for 20 years. I clap Rebecca, not me. She's the one that put up with me, right? But, you know, 20 years. And, and, and you can't have a strong marriage if there's no talking. Can you imagine if, you know, you, you get together after work and you meet and you sort of give each other the silent treatment, the, the relationship ain't going to go very far, is it? So talking is a basic element of a relationship. And, and the same is true with our relationship with God. Uh, it's a relationship we have with God. And so therefore, talking needs to be part of our normal relationship we have with him. We talk to him. The reality is that we haven't all been called to stand up here and preach. That's true. We haven't all been called to join the worship team. We certainly all haven't been called to lead worship. But we have all been called to pray. Isn't it true that, that we're called to pray or that I'm not called to be on the worship team? Don't answer that. What do you mean both? So we've all been called to pray. In fact, if we turn to the book of Isaiah 56, let's start there. In Isaiah 56, it says, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Isn't it awesome that Isaiah prophesied this? Many, many years, hundreds of years before Jesus even came on the scene. So it's no wonder when Jesus came to the temple and they were kind of like trying to profit from the sacrificial offerings and all that stuff, that he turned tables upside down and echoed the prophecy of Isaiah. And he says in Matthew 21 verse 10, he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. The point of this is that we have been called to be a house of prayer. 
We, we know through Scripture that we are actually now the temple of the Holy Spirit. We now carry the presence of God within us. His Spirit lives in us, which makes us his temple. So before I've been called to be a pastor, before I've been called to preach, before I've been called to join the worship team, hallelujah, she says here at the front, I've been called a house of prayer. That's the basics of my DNA, good old-fashioned prayer. There's a lot of benefits in prayer, so I'm just going to quickly look at some. The first one I want to talk about is how prayer activates a spiritual productivity, how prayer kind of, when we look at prayer, prayer is a means of us When we pray, what we're actually doing is we're submitting ourselves to God. When we pray, we're sort of declaring that God is who he is and I need God to be God and I can submit to him. That's why we pray. We pray when we we need help. So we pray to be productive. It is through prayer that God can conquer things. In fact, without prayer, if I was to get up here or we were to come together on a Sunday and, 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 and have church like we did, and if we're to do this without prayer, well, we're really just creating an environment of, well, we'd be more of an entertainment center rather than a house of prayer. And we haven't been called to be an entertainment center. If you want good old entertainment, Uh, there's a better place to get entertained than coming to church. Although church can be quite entertaining. Your pastor is a bit of a character sometimes. But this is not where you would sort of come expecting, I'm going to go there today hoping that I can be entertained. And without prayer, we're going to find that our walk with God is not going to be effective. We're going to be laboring in vain. You see, prayer is the power to expand the kingdom of God. It's the weapon for pushing back the gates of hell. I remember um, working in, 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 when we came from Indonesia, I started working in a company. It was a stone company, and um, that's kitchen stones, you know, in case you're thinking what Frank was getting stoned. No, not that stone, the kitchen stones and bench tops, you know. And I was working there, and the people that worked there, like, they were full on tradies. Uh, every second word out of their mouth was words that I could probably not use from the pulpit. Not probably, for sure. <laughs> and, and, and they were kind of rough guys. None of them knew God. They were really far. And I remember after a couple of weeks of being there, I'm like, Lord, this is like, you know, a uh, tough environment to work in. And, uh, and I remember thinking, Lord, why am I here? And I started praying, and I felt that God dropped me into that place to be a light. So you know what I did? I started praying for my workplace. And I started praying for all the guys. I made a spiritual hit list. That's what I knew what to do before I was a Christian, so I just went with what I knew, you know. And I made a spiritual hit list and started praying for all these guys. And do you know what happened? Like within months, I started having morning uh, production meetings right, because I was the manager of the, the, the place there. So I started having these production meetings. And then I started, and I started, so I did that first, and then I started praying for guys. And within a couple of months, those production meetings turned into a prayer meeting because every morning we'd come together and I'd be like, all right, so who needs any prayer? And this, you know, person over here needed, you know, help with the husband and because, you know, they were going to get divorced, so we'd pray for her and then we'd pray for this guy's issues and that lady. And they all started seeing God move in their lives. And none of them were church people. None of them even knew who God was. And it began to infect them and influence them in the way of God. And then they started to turn, and many of them started coming to church. And it was like a revival happening within that workplace, that people would come and they came to know God. Why? Because prayer. Prayer empowers us to go and do the things that he needs us to do. In fact, when we pray, it's not that it empowers us, but when we pray, it's like we're empowering God to go before us. Otherwise, we're just doing it in our own strength. The second point I wanted to mention, which is on the board there, is that prayer activates healing. 
You see, when we pray, things happen. When we pray, people can get healed. So we see here in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind. So we see here from this scripture a little insight that as we pray, anxiety flees. As we pray, our minds begin to line up with the mind of God. You see, prayer has the power to bring about healing within our bodies and healing for others as we pray for them as well. It is through prayer that we can keep our mind unfocused. I mean, yeah, I won't touch other things. But the point I'm trying to make is that through the power of prayer, we can help ourselves be stayed focused and, and not let our minds run 100 miles an hour. Maybe you've been struggling with anxiety. Maybe you're struggling with stress. Maybe there's things that have been weighed upon you. Maybe there's pressures of life. Maybe there's financial issues. Maybe there's relational issues. Maybe there's a sense of hopelessness or a sense of feeling depressed. The Bible teaches us that when we pray, When we pray, the peace of God can come upon us. Why? Because as we pray, we're uplifting him, like what Jade shared in communion today. As we pray, we put the focus on God and not the focus on the problem. Because if we focus on the problem, well, that's exactly what the enemy wants, doesn't he? I mean, think about in the beginning in the garden, you know, God said to Adam and Eve, you can have anything from the garden. It's all yours. Just don't take from this one. And what did the devil do? He came and he put, took their focus off everything and made them focus on the one thing that would have caused them an issue. And so we've got to be careful that we don't become victims of that. We need to be people who could stay focused and pray because prayer heals us. And as we pray for others, it heals them. And also, did you know that as we pray for our land, our land can be healed? Because in Second Chronicles 7.14, it says, If my people... That's us, by the way. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Did you know that the condition of our land could be affected by how much we pray? The condition of your neighbourhood can be affected by how much you pray. Did you know the condition of your street can be affected by how much you pray? I remember um, when we were living in the western suburbs of Melbourne. It was a pretty rough area. And, uh, and I remember I'd come home from work and, and Jade was, I don't know, how old she was. She was about this tall. and So I'd walk with her and go for a bit of a walk with her around the whole block. And as we'd go and walk, we'd pray over every house. We'd pray for the people in that house. We'd pray that they'd be blessed. We'd pray that the Spirit of God will be there. We'd pray that they would have a revelation of God, that their eyes will be open, that their ears will be unblocked, that their hearts will be softened. And we'd just pray over every single house as we walked around the street. And do you know what happened? We saw so much, I I don't want to call it a revival. We'd seen so many people come to know God in that block. One time a guy came banging on our doors in desperation, saying, are you the people that cast out demons? We'd never met this guy before in our lives, never had a conversation with him. And he came banging on the door saying, are you the people that cast out demons? I have a demon in my house. My wife is being levitated off the ground. Only God can lead someone to knock on our door that we don't know and know that somehow we are able to go and and pray and cast out demons. Another guy, our next-door neighbours, they they got saved, the two young kids that were like, you know, always killing each other. And, and, And they radically got saved. Another guy was walking past and I was working on my ute one day with the bonnet open. I was doing something in the engine and this guy walks past and he goes, oh, hey, mate, nice car. I said, yeah. He goes, 
I, I, I don't know why, I just felt led to talk to you. He said, because uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I just came to know Jesus. I'm like, well, that's cool, man. I said, you know, I've been praying for everyone. And where do you live? And he told me. I said, we pray for the Every day my daughter and I walk around here and we pray. Prayer brings about a change in our environment. I mean, think about how God created the earth. He spoke and his words brought about a change to the environment. Did you know that we have the power to change our environment? The third point is that prayer activates deliverance. In Psalm 107, 28 verse 30, I love this scripture. On your youth, good to see. It says, Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storms to a whisper and stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbour. It's a powerful scripture that indicates the power of God that when we're in the midst of a storm, that as we cry out to God, he can come and he can calm the waters. Does this sound a bit familiar? Maybe in the, in the New Testament when Jesus was you know, coming about to his disciples and he walked on, there was a storm going and all that, and did he not calm the waters so he could bring them safely to the harbour? I encourage you when you're reading, especially the New Testament, think about you know, how that ties in with the Old Testament because there's so many gems in the whole Bible, how it all fits together. And sometimes we can miss that because we become tunnel vision, but that's another sermon for another day. The point is that we see here the example how when we cry out to God, he can bring the waves to a flatness. And there's many examples and stories we can give about that. But I'm going to keep moving on. I think you get the point that God brings about our deliverance and he can heal, save us from situations. Maybe your life, right now you might be going through a bit of a storm. As we cry out to Jesus, he can bring calmness into the situation. So prayer is powerful. Prayer also protects us from temptation. In Matthew 26, verse 41, we, we find the account here where Jesus is about to go to the cross and he's in so much distress and Jesus himself could have done anything. He could have stopped himself from going to the cross, but he didn't want to because he needed to in order to bring about our salvation. So he knew what he was about to go through and knew how challenging it was, yet he himself still knew that I needed to pray to prepare myself to go through what I'm about to go through. And then he gives us another little insight and speaks to his disciples. And as he's talking to them, he's encouraging them to pray. He comes back, they've fallen asleep, and then he, he speaks to them again. He's like, come on, man, what's wrong with you people, he says. And he says, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So we see a little insight here that as we pray, it will actually empower us to overcome temptations that might come our way. Is it possible that we sometimes fall into temptations, we get dragged into stuff, we get pushed away, and we end up sort of in places we shouldn't end up in, and then we realise afterwards, because hindsight's always a good thing, isn't it? We realise, oh, if only I had prayed, maybe it might have empowered me to say no. Because as it says in Galatians 5, that as we walk in the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit will become fruit in our lives, one of which is self-control. So we can say no to things that we know we shouldn't say yes to because we have self-control. But if we're not walking in the Spirit, if we're not spending time in God's Word and interacting with God and communicating with Him, the fruits of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, these things are not going to be evident in our lives. And we're not going to be able to pick off the fruit from the tree because we haven't watered the tree 
to generate those fruits. And so by, by, by being prayerful, we're going to be able to actually put God in his place, submit to his authority in acknowledgement that I need to pray because God is who he says he is. And therefore, by doing those sorts of things, we're, we're both taking on the right position and we can then allow the, the, the things of God to, to strengthen us and to not be given into temptation. So when we look at this and we see that, you know, prayer brings about spiritual productivity, that prayer activates healing within ourselves, to others and to our land, when prayer brings about, uh, activates a deliverance in our lives from problems, when prayer protects us from temptations, it's no wonder that we've been called to pray before anything else. And it's no wonder that the enemy, the devil himself, will pull out every trick, every stop to try and prevent you from prayer because prayer is powerful. Prayer changes things. In Matthew 4, we see the account of when Jesus had just been baptised at the end of chapter 3 and then he walks into chapter 4. And, and goes into the wilderness for 40 days. And whilst he's in the wilderness, fasting and connecting and, and, and preparing himself for the ministry that was ahead, it says that then Satan came to tempt him. And, and, and what speaks to me through that is just because you come to church, that's not immunity from attacks of the enemy. Just because, you know, I'm a Christian and I hang around other believers doesn't stop the enemy from trying to derail me from the purposes of God. And, and so we need to be aware of this. We need to maintain a heart of prayerfulness. Prayer is a powerful weapon that we have, yet it's probably the most neglected ministry in the body of Christ. Isn't it mind-boggling that one of the most powerful tools that we have are neglected? And then we wonder why people aren't walking around with such victory and power and, and the presence of God flowing through them or seeing signs and wonders following them. It's no wonder that society is downward spiralling. It's no wonder that we see divorce rates going through the roof. It's no wonder that we see mental illness at an all-time high. It's no wonder that we see so much lawlessness increasing and so much craziness in this world. Because as the people of God, maybe we've neglected to humble ourselves and pray as it says in Chronicle 7. Sometimes we can look at it like, if we're not praying, the army of God is asleep. And it's like, we're going, imagine we were going to war. Imagine a war broke out and we all had to go and fight. And we all went onto the battlefield and we're like, right, we're going to go and we're going to fight this enemy. And we all just start running but leave all our machine guns behind in the barracks. That's like a suicide mission, entering a battlefield without the weapons. And sometimes we like that as Christians. We don't realise we're in a battlefield. It may not look like it because there aren't guns and fires and bombs, but there's a spiritual battle going on, a spiritual battle for destiny, for people to enter into the kingdom of God or for people to remain in the kingdom of darkness. And the minute we, we come alive spiritually and enter into the kingdom of God, like we're in a battle zone. But if we're walking in that battle zone without our weapons, the good old word of God, good old prayer, then it's like we've put our ammunition down. And it's like multitudes of angels 
are unemployed. I just thought, imagine we did a, you know, you see those unemployment stats. What's our unemployment rate for Victoria, whatever? Imagine we did an unemployment stats for angels. I mean, Jesus, when they came to arrest him, he's like, oh, what are you doing? Chill out, don't worry. You know, he cuts his guy, some guy cut his ear off and then he puts it back on. He was like, take it easy. He goes, you know, I have the authority to call upon thousands of angel, legions of angels to protect me. But he had to go through what he needed to do, so he decided not to because it wasn't part of the plan. But in other words, we have access into the heavenly realms and it's kind of like unactivated if we're not praying. Does that make sense? It's interesting that the disciples who walked with Jesus for three years asked Jesus to teach him, to teach him stuff. But you know, the only thing that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them was how to pray. Teach us to pray, they said. And he taught them, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And he went through and taught them the Lord's Prayer. But isn't it funny that they didn't ask him how to cast out demons? They didn't ask him, how do we go and preach into all the nations? They didn't ask him, how do we go and build your kingdom? They asked him, how do we pray? Because they understood the power behind what Jesus did, because they saw him spending time in the morning, time in the evening, everywhere they went, he'd say, I just got to go to a quiet place and pray. They knew something that we may not notice from reading these scriptures, that the power behind what Jesus did came from an intimacy with God. And it's a power that we have. So... I want to quickly look at how can we develop a strong prayer life. Now, I'm not going to give you methods because that's generally where we end up in our human thinking. Oh, what's the method? Give me the box. I'll tick this, do that. I want to come back to the foundation because it's actually about our heart. It's about our attitude towards God. And that's if we get that right, prayer's going to naturally come. When Rebecca and I started dating and she fell in love with me, I didn't need to tell her to ring me. She would ring me all the time. I shouldn't tell Fibs. I rang her sometimes too. It was kind of 50-50. You know what I mean? But like when you enter into a relationship, you don't need a reminder on your phone to say, oh, better ring my girlfriend. You know what I mean? It, forget the reminder, mate. You, whatever minute you've got, I'm on my lunch break. Quick, I'm going to ring my, my girlfriend. You know, driving home, quick, I've got Bluetooth. Up. Do, 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 do. Hey, how you going? Yeah, just got a half an hour drive. I thought I'd talk to you. Oh, yeah, cool. And you get home, you're cooking, you put on speaker because you want to cook and still talk. And in everything you do, you try to include that person and just have a and talk about nothing. You ever noticed? Hours and hours of conversations to talk about nothing. Why? Because there's a connection there. You don't need to be told to make a phone call or, uh, yeah, oh, get a honey, yeah, really nice that we started dating. Uh, let me just check my calendar. I'll make an appointment and maybe I'll call you. How's next Friday 10 o'clock sound? I've got a spare spot between 10 and 10.30. I'll call you then. Is that okay? That doesn't happen. Why? Because that, once the heart is there, boom, everything happens. So it's not about methods. It's about a heart condition. You see, religion makes it about methods. Relationship makes it about heart. Isn't that cool? So nothing wrong with methods, and sometimes we need methods to keep us on track, but the foundation's got to be the heart. Otherwise, it becomes legalism. So number one, I'm going to give you four quick points. Number one, we need to choose God. And in Joshua 24, when, you know, um, Joshua was addressing the people to make it quick, he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He talks about, you know, he, he says here, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. You see, it's a choice we make. 
I know we convince ourselves that I can't pray because I'm too tired or I can't pray because I get bored or I can't pray because I don't know what to do. And we make up a thousand excuses why I can't pray or why I don't read the Bible or why whatever. But at the end of the day, everything is a choice that we can make. So it's got to start with a choice. I choose to serve the Lord. Amen? Number two, I kind of touched on this, and that is that we need to Fall in love with God. It's funny how in Deuteronomy 6 it says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Notice as they were introducing uh, instructions to the children of Israel, God focused on starting with, with loving the Lord your God with all your heart. Because if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, everything else will be easy. Amen? But then Jesus comes on the scene. Thousand, uh, you know, whatever, how many years later. And, and he says, anyone, you must, uh, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And he's basically echoing Deuteronomy. Because he knows that this is where it all starts. If you have the heart, the conversations come easy. If you have the heart, serving is not a chore. If you have the heart, everything falls in line and becomes a joy. Amen? So why I'm saying this is because we need to make it about a heart. That if you're trying to say, well, that's it. I heard Pastor Frank preaching. I've been uh, convicted or inspired and I'm going to have a Strong prayer life now. But if you don't fall in love with God and do it out of that love, it's just going to be, I don't know, religion. And religion sucks. Can I say that in church? It's a bit late. I said it already. Sometimes things come out and I'm like, what am I saying? So the point is maybe we need to go back a step and maybe – Remember and fall in love with who he is. To reflect and remember that he actually died for me. You know, to remember that, man, I was destined for hell. There I was as a DJ, drug manufacturing dealer, this, that, and the other. And he saved me. And he brought me into the kingdom of life. And I should have gone to hell. But he died so that I could be spared. Goodness. How can you not fall in love with someone that sacrificed themselves for you? So if we're struggling to be in that place of love, we need to come back into that remembrance of who he is and what he's done for us. Amen? The third point is to approach God with confidence. In Hebrews 14, verse 16, he says, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy He will find grace to help us when we need it most. Such a powerful scripture. Do you know how many people I speak to or have spoken to over 20 years or so in ministry where they're like, oh, but they kind of don't really want to come and ask God for things because I don't deserve it. I've been a bad guy. You know, God doesn't want to bless me. Or what right do I have to come before God when I've lived the life so bad? Or, you know, God's so busy, there's, you know, so many people, he's got to look after me, why would he give me the time of day? The scriptures say to come boldly before him. I know in a courtroom setting that we can't approach the bench, we can't go to the judge without him giving us a summons to come before him. But that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is that we can boldly come before him. You see, in a courtroom... When you're being trialed on something that you're about to be condemned for, the judge doesn't put himself in your shoes and then take the punishment for you and let you go free and then he puts himself in jail. The kingdom of God is, is that very thing that Jesus took the punishment and now he's like, look, I died for you. I put myself on a cross, went through all this torture and pain for you. Now, please, don't make what I've done a waste of time. Use it. Come to me. Access that mercy and that grace because I want to pour my love upon you. And so we need to be confidently and boldly coming before him and not be scared to ask him for stuff. 
That's why Jesus said the kingdom of God is, is like the children because kids come. When my kids want something, they don't hold back. They come expecting with their hands, oh, come on, Dad. Why? Because they know I'm their father and they know I'm there for them. That does not give you license to just come. I'm not God. But you know what I'm saying? We need to have that access and know that that's what it's like and that he's not only wanting us to come, but he's eagerly waiting for us to come to him. He's sitting there saying, come on, please. I can see you going through all this stuff. I can see you going through all these problems and challenges and issues and addictions and whatever. Come to me. I'm here to help you. I've actually done it on the cross already. So please come to me so I can walk with you. I can hold you so that you don't go through this alone. And I can take you through it. So we need to boldly come before him. And the last point with having the right attitude to develop a strong prayer life is to expect, to come expectant, to expect him to answer and to expect to receive. In Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Jesus himself is encouraging us to ask because he wants to help. But he wants us to ask because he wants us to still put him in the rightful place. Amen? I'm going to call up the worship team. And I want to pray for all of us. You know, my prayer today, leading up to today, was that we would walk away from here feeling a conviction, not a condemnation. I don't want anyone to walk away feeling condemned, oh, because I don't have a prayer life. That's cool. It's about being convicted to know, okay, this is where I'm at, but that's where I want to be. So my hope today is that we would simply take one step closer to whatever that is, to wherever you are. I mean, in this room, we'd have people on all different scales. For some of us, maybe some of us may be in this room and maybe we haven't even entered into a relationship with God. And you might be hearing me talk and you're like, well, what's he talking about? Well, you see, in the beginning, God created us to be in relationship with him. But then, through sin, disobedience, we were separated from God. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus then came down. He stepped out of heaven. God became a man. And he died and paid the price for sin so that his death on the cross brought about redemption for us. It brought about a way for us to connect back with God, that through Jesus dying on the cross, the Bible says that if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. So Jesus came and died for us so that we could be united back with him in relationship with him. That's the good news, that you don't have to strive. You don't have to try and perform. You don't have to tick 20 boxes before he'll accept you. He wants us to boldly come before him and say, yes, Lord, I want you in my life. So I want to give us the opportunity for that. So let's all close our eyes for a moment so that we can all have a bit of privacy and not worry about what's around you. And just use this moment to connect with God. Let him speak to you. And if you're here today and you're like, yes, Pastor Frank, I want to enter into that relationship with God. I want to receive him as Lord and Saviour. I want him to make my life on track back with him. If that's you, then let's pray this prayer together to encourage those who are wanting to make that commitment with God. 
Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you. I acknowledge that I have sinned. But today, I choose you. Today, I accept you as my Lord and my Saviour. Today, I become your child and you become my Father. In Jesus' name, and the people of God say, Amen.